それでは次のトークに移りたいと思います。ジョーさんはシンチンさんで、パルコンカレンシーファン、アシンコルインパルティックです。よろしくお願いします。Konnichiwa, I'm Jonathan, and I'm very happy to be here in、uh, Japan at Yapsi Asia to speak to you today. A little bit about me.、Um, if you're wondering where I am, by the way, in the photo, it's New Zealand on a glacier. I like cold places, so I'm finding it very hot here.、Um, I work on the Rakuto Perl 6 compiler.、Um, I created and lead development of MoreVM, which is、uh, The virtual machine that、uh, most people are using to, to run their Perl 6 programs.、Um, when I'm not working on Perl 6, I also work as a software architect and teacher.、Uh, recently in Sweden and、uh, in the last couple of months, I moved to Prague and、uh, that is now going to be home. So I have a, a new beautiful、uh, city to enjoy now. So I got three topics I want to talk about today. Parallelism, asynchrony, and、uh, concurrency. These three are different and often confused,、uh, often not talked about very precisely. When I teach these topics,、uh, I find that it's so common to talk about them imprecisely and that I have to keep、uh, thinking myself to do so. But I think it's important to understand what they are and how they are different because the sorts of solutions that we should employ、uh, when we face different kinds of problems、uh, are going to vary. So, the other thing about this area is there's a history of pain. There's a history of having to work with things that are difficult and that tend to sort of catch us out. One thing that often hurts plenty is when we optimize, we often write code that avoids making lots of copies of data. So we have a lot of mutation in our programs. And then when we add threads to try and make things faster, that really comes back to hurt us because now we have a lot of data races. So then we say, oh, I use locks. And of course, then you get deadlocks a bunch of the time if you're not really, really, really careful. Um, and then you have you know, things like condition variables, which you know, sound great. You can signal something when it can get on with its work, very efficient.、Um, but of course, you're sat there waiting for something to happen. And you know, occasionally, it will, the operating system will come and it will say, oh, the thing happened, but it actually didn't yet. And you have to sort of remember that.、Um, so there's lots of ways to make all kinds of mistakes. One thing that strikes me about software development is that long, long ago, we had the structured programming revolution. It kind of seems strange to us today, maybe, to think that once there was a very serious debate over whether using things like if statements and while loops or for loops or all and subroutines, even, compared to go to, was actually a good idea. Uh, nowadays, we are pretty much convinced that we should use those things. You know, maybe it's okay to use GoTo once a month. Occasionally, it works out more cleanly, but it's rare. But in other areas, I think we're still sort of exploring this structured thing. If I look at a lot of systems that I'm asked to,、uh, to sort of、uh, assist with architecturally, when I look at the way they handle data, many, many times, What I find is there's one huge database for everything, and the transaction boundaries can be anywhere. Having to scale very large is teaching us lessons there. And we're starting to learn when we build large scale systems to get information into small, isolated islands. But still, I think we're very much on the journey there. I'd say that we're also making progress on finding structured ways to deal with. Uh, parallelism, concurrency, and asynchrony. And this has changed、uh, quite a bit in mainstream languages over, I'd say, the last decade,、uh, where you know, rather than this being a, a more niche area, this is something that, that most programmers are starting to have to deal with. So, what I want to do today is talk about various of those structured approaches. And、uh, because I've actually been working on the Perl 6 implementations of these down at the VM level and in the compiler level and、uh, contributing there, I'm going to use that to illustrate my, my various examples. So, 
So let's start out by looking at parallelism. Now, parallelism uh, is all about these modern multi-core CPUs that we want to exploit, okay? So if you, you go look at a, uh, a diagram of a modern CPU, it looks like that. You see there's four things that look like copy-pastes of each other. They are, they're four different cores. Um, that huge big thing at the bottom there is shared uh, cache memory uh, between them. But uh, if you look at the history of CPUs, I remember when I was a child and I would get these computer magazines. We didn't have internet access uh, at home at that time. It was a while ago and uh, it was very exciting. You would have a, you know, a, a 25 megahertz computer and then a 66 megahertz and a, a, a 666 megahertz and then we got to the gigahertz. And I was there sort of thinking, when I'm 30, I will have a 50 gigahertz computer. I didn't get one. Um, and the reason I didn't get one is because the way they were making CPUs have faster and faster clock speeds was making the transistors and the circuitry in them smaller and smaller. And you can see this is a nice exponential curve. So what kind of happened, you know, was uh, physics, okay? Physics happened. And uh, if we do a little bit of math, this is the hardest math in the whole talk, okay? Um, so uh, what we'll do is we will take uh, the speed of light, we will divide into it the number of cycles that a three gigahertz CPU does uh, per second. You find that per cycle, you can move information about 10 centimeters. And what we've been doing is making the circuitry smaller and smaller and smaller so that we were able to uh, you know, get the data moved through the circuitry needed in one clock cycle uh, more quickly. But eventually, we couldn't do that anymore. We're already down to making transistors out of just tens of atoms. It's quite incredible. So the solution that the CPU designers sort of came up with, and this isn't a new solution because they've been doing this secretly for a while anyway, but they said, we're gonna have to have people do multiple things at the same time. And while they'd secretly done a lot of parallelism you couldn't see to make your programs faster, now they said, okay, you're going to have to sort of write multi-threaded programs to exploit this hardware. So the first thing to note about parallelism is that it's a property of your solution, okay? It's about choosing to do multiple things at the same time in hope that the wall clock time, that is the time you measure on your clock uh, to solve a problem will be less, okay? So parallelism isn't something that occurs because of the problem we're facing, okay? We could solve the problem sequentially, but we choose to do things in parallel. And the second nice thing about that is parallel programs have a very simple correctness property. That is, do they produce equally correct results as the sequential program? So let's take a really simple little example. This is a, a very simple little program. It uh, grabs the JSON tiny library, it slurps in two files and decodes them as JSON. I get two data structures, I then compare them for what we call snapshot equivalence. And uh, then I can just say, okay, they're identical or they're different, okay? And of course, this means that if we have uh, the hash keys in a different order, but the JSON uh, is the same, okay, everything will work out. So when I look at this program, what I notice is that there's two tasks that are happening here that have no dependencies between them. And I can say, oh, okay, if there's two things and they don't depend on each other, then that means I can do them in parallel, okay? So let's do that, okay? It se seems easy, okay? But of course, if we uh, actually do go and start doing things like this, okay, there's always all these buts, okay? Let's do it in parallel, but all these things. How many tasks can we do at the same time? It depends on the hardware we're running on. It depends on what else is happening on the computer. 
if we have a very busy system, we shouldn't create lots of threads and make the situation easy, even worse. If we have eight cores doing nothing, sure, we can uh, make good use of them. So it's not a static property of the program. And then we have, you know, how do we correctly wait for the results to be computed and get them back to the code that's waiting for them? And how do we correctly handle exceptions? You know, if we get a crash in one of the tasks, how do we make sure that gets handled properly and communicated back to uh, the place that initiated the work? So here is the, uh, the FELSEC solution to, uh, to this, or the easiest one, okay? What's changed? All that's changed is they say start up there, okay? And start means take this work and do it off on some thread somewhere. It doesn't mean start a thread. Okay, it just means I want this work to be done in parallel. And you leave it up to a scheduler to decide things like how many threads, okay, is it worth doing this in parallel with the other task and so forth. And then well, I have these two things and I want to unpack the results of them because what I get back uh, from those is a promise, okay? So, I've scheduled the work on the thread pool, but I need to wait for it to be done. Now, waiting also needs care, because we don't want a situation where we're doing busy waiting, where we sat in a loop, eating CPU, waiting for things to happen. So we have a wait, okay? A wait is a very efficient way to, to wait for things to be done. Um, it tries to sort of do the best thing it can. In this case, it's probably going to end up uh, using some kind of condition variable to do it. Um, but uh, you don't have to worry about that. Now what it will do is it will get the results of those. I can just assign them into two variables there. And if there's any exceptions, the exceptions will be thrown here in the context of the code that is waiting for them. Okay? So that means that I have the uh, efficient way of waiting solved. I have a way of getting the result back and I have a way of getting any errors back. That's task parallelism, okay? And task parallelism is where you look at things and say, okay, our code does this, and then it does this, and it could do these at the same time. There's another kind of parallelism, though, and that I also want to address. And uh, here's our next little problem that I want to consider. So I have a big data set about climate, okay? Where in the world uh, the temperature has been uh, hot, cold, whatever, over time. So I've got loads of temperature data from thousands of weather stations. And what I want to do is I want to find all of the data from weather stations in Europe, and I want to then find the place with the maximum temperature, okay? So here is a little program to do that. Let's just, uh, and this is not parallel, okay? Now, what we're doing here is uh, we have a bunch of file names that we're obtaining by looking in a directory. And then I just map those file names with uh, slurp, okay, which reads the file in. And then I pass them into a data structure. I filter out those uh, that are in Europe, okay? So I now have all the European climate data. And then I say, I want to find the maximum one by the average temperature. And then I can say that place is the hottest. Now, one thing that might surprise you a little bit if you're looking at this as uh, Perl 6 code, uh, and you, you come from a, you know, a Perl 5 background, normally when you use uh, map, grep, and so on, you would assign things into arrays. You can do that and it will do exactly what you expect, and you will end up with lots of arrays of intermediate results. But if we just shove these things into a scalar, we're talking about a pipeline. And that means that it doesn't actually do any work until I ask for the maximum. Okay, and at that point it says, okay, now I really have to do all of the work to compute a value. And we don't keep intermediate state around when we do this. Okay, we don't have to sort of get all of the data into memory from these tens of thousands of climate files, we can just pull them through one at a time down this pipeline. So it can be very memory efficient to work this way. So 
that's how it's working, okay, one at a time. And if you look at this, you might say, well, um, I wonder if uh, we could sort of evaluate data items in parallel. What if I could take two of these climate files and I could pull them through the pipeline at the same time? So we're not breaking up tasks this time, we're breaking up data. So what we'll have is we'll have a given uh, file name and maybe we'll have two different threads, okay? And at the same time, one will grab one file, it will do all the things on it, okay? It will do all the things on the other one. The reason that you want to structure it like this is because the data that you got and are working on will then be thread local through all of the stages, which is really important for performance, okay? Because multi-thread performance is all about the CPU cache. Okay, so it sounds like a nice thing to do, but uh, of course, there's problems too. Uh, how do we distribute the work? How do we collect the results? What if we have to keep results of parallel work in the same order as the inputs, okay? How do we deal with exceptions and so on? Once again, Perl6 has a pretty declarative solution for this. That's all the thing that I have to add, okay? That, that bit that I've circled there is the whole addition to what we make to this program. And at the start of the pipeline, we just say, I want to opt in to parallel processing. I say race, okay? And race means just grab these items out of there, um, distribute them to threads, and give me the results as quickly as possible, uh, no matter what order they come in. Now, because we're finding the maximum, okay, the maximum of a set of temperatures is going to be the same no matter what order we look at all of the, the different temperatures in. And that's it. That's all we have to do to, to get a, a potentially very nice speed up on this. And you can configure, uh, you know, with Wraith, you can choose uh, the number of items at a time to back, batch up and send off to a thread to work on. You can choose how many you're gonna have Okay, with hyper instead of race, what you're saying is I care about getting results back in the same order as the inputs. And both batch and degree are optional. And if you leave them out and just say this, what you're saying is please try and work out the best size of batch and the, the best number of threads for me. Which in, uh, in the future as we tune this more and more will be an increasingly good thing to do. Okay, because we'll be able to look at the actual load you have on your system. Okay, so that's parallel. Let's do asynchrony. So asynchrony is all about things that are going to happen in the future, and when they happen is not under our control. Okay, they can happen whenever they please. And worse than that, maybe if we're interested in 10 things, Okay, maybe some of them can happen about the same time, or some of them uh, can happen in all kinds of different orders. That's what tends to make this a little bit more difficult. So lots and lots of examples of asynchronous uh, data out there. Okay, so we set the process off to do some work. Later on, it finishes, completes. Um, maybe we, uh, you know, we send a web request off. When do we get the response? Well, whenever the network and the server decide we do. Um, we have incoming connections to a server. We have user interactions with a user interface, signals. All of these things are examples of data where stuff just happens. And it happens when it likes, and we need to react to that. Now, in some common cases, of course, you know, we don't have to go and worry about this. For example, uh, you know, sometimes, suppose I'm uploading a file somewhere, if it's just the one, I can say, okay, start working on it, okay, and give me control back when it's finished. But often that doesn't scale far enough. So let's just look at a little example, okay? So this is uh, just a, uh, a simple little for loop going over a bunch of uh, ob objects describing files to upload. And what we say is just run the secure copy program, uh, copy this local file to this target server, okay? And of course, this is doing one at a time. 
So we'll do one upload, okay, and then it'll be finished, and then we'll do the next one. Um, but we might say, well, we might get better utilization of the network if we could do, say, four at a time. So what I'll do is a little refactor, okay? And what I've got here is uh, just a small change. I've said I want to create a process that's as uh, asynchronously, okay, and I run this. Um, and uh, what I actually get back from that is a promise. Okay, so promises in Pulse X are basically a way of talking about anything that will produce a result in the future. And they don't just have to be about code, okay, they can be about IO or, or just about anything else, really. Now, if I just want to recreate the program I had before, I will, e I will start the process and I will immediately await it, okay? And this is just a very long way of uh, writing this. Okay, so no, no improvement yet. But let's uh, get a little bit smarter because we don't have to await a promise right away. What we can do is we can make an array up there and we can push all the promises into the array and then we can await them at the end. Okay, that, that wasn't too bad a refactor. The only problem now is that, you know, we'll set off all of this work and you know, maybe we have 50 things, okay? Now setting 50 uploads off at the same time, that's probably not very good for our network. So we need to just throttle this back a bit. How do we do that? Well, here's one simple way of doing it. We can just sort of say, if the number of things we're working on now is, has reached four, then wait any of them to be completed. So this promise any of, I call it a promise combinator. Okay, it's something that takes many promises and gives me one that is based upon all of them in some kind of combination. And this is when any of them are done. And then I'll just grab out the ones that have been completed. Okay, so I'm left with the ones that are still being worked on. And then we'll go around the loop and add some more. And you'll note this solution naturally handles if two complete around the same time. Okay, so that's a sort of simpler async situation. That's the case where, you know, we set off uh, a piece of work and later on it comes back with one result. But uh, more interesting asynchronous situations see us receive many asynchronous values over time. And, uh, you know, there's, again, you know, some of those examples that I did earlier are just like that. So if I say I'm interested in getting notified whenever a particular file changes or whenever files in a particular directory change, that will be many asynchronous events. If I have a control on a user interface and the user is typing text into a text box, there'll be many different text changed events over time. Okay, if I have a socket and I'm receiving data from it and it's throwing this data at me, lots of packets of data arrive over time. These are all cases where we have asynchronous data, but it's not one thing that we can await, it's many things that will happen over time. So, if you like, you can think a little bit of promise as like the asynchronous scalar in Perl. And we have another thing which is a little bit like the asynchronous array, okay? It's actually closer to an asynchronous sequence because it doesn't remember stuff really, it's, a, it's more of a pipeline. And we call this thing a supply, okay? It's a supply of values that can come over time. And supplies can be infinite, okay? And when we have an infinite supply, we just get values, we call it emitted, okay? So this data source will emit a value and another value and there's no particular end. Some supplies are finite, okay? They reach an end and they reach a successful end and at some point they say, I'm done, okay? All of the values that we're getting have arrived now. So, you know, if I am receiving a, a bunch of uh, packets, at some point the, the uh, sender closes the connection and uh, then I get a, a done message telling me there won't be any more, okay, it's finished. 
Sometimes you also get an error while we're trying to produce all of these values. So, you know, you'll sort of be receiving all of that data from the socket, and then at some point, um, it will do a quit, okay? It will say, oh, something went wrong, and here is the, the exception that occurred. And the exception will also be propagated asynchronously. So, what I want to do is just, uh, just work with the file notifications and I want to build a little asynchronous test runner. Something so when I'm working on my code and my tests, okay, whenever I make a change and save some of the files, what will happen is I will uh, get my tests run automatically, okay, and maybe I have a couple of screens or a couple of windows, and then one of them it will be continually running my tests whenever I change things. So uh, let's just uh, build this, this little program, okay? So first of all, how do we watch files in Perl 6? Well, uh, that's easy, this is built in. Uh, you say, I want to watch this path, okay? And uh, that's a method on this, this IO notification class. That gives me back a supply, okay? And then I can tap the supply. You can think of it a little bit like turning on a tap, okay? Yes, you can turn it off again if you get uninterested as well. Um, but uh, then all we'll do is we'll just put a closure there and we'll just uh, react whenever a file changed, okay? We'll just say, it changed. Now, one thing that you might think about at this moment is, well, a supply feels a bit like sort of a pipeline. A little bit like when I showed you data parallel work earlier. Okay, the difference is that when I showed you the data parallel things, at the very end of the chain, I said max. And the call to max caused us to pull all of the data items through that pipeline. Okay, it's a pull model. Supplies can also be arranged into sets of steps. But this time, it's a push. Okay, so data occurs asynchronously and it's pushed through all of the operations in the pipeline. Now, one of the nice things is there's a bit of mathematics called category theory and it turns out that these uh, are called jewels, okay? These are very closely related and all you have to know that means is that anything you can uh, s sensibly define on a synchronous sequence of values, you can also define on an asynchronous sequence of values. So, for example, I can grep a supply. Okay, what does it do? Well, it gives me another supply, and when I tap that code supply, okay, it in turn will tap the changes, and then whenever a file change notification occurs, that notification will be pushed into my grep, okay, and if the condition is true, here I'm just checking does it end in .pm or .p6, okay, then it will push onwards that change notification, okay, and I mean say, oh, a source code file changed. So a lot of the things that you're used to doing with lists and arrays with synchronous data, you can now take and do with asynchronous data. And you can do all sorts of things like saying, well, I only want, say, unique asynchronous values. But because asynchronous programming is often very concerned with time, we have a lot of time-based things as well. So you can say, I only want one value per second, or I only want values to be unique within a 10-second range, but after that, forget about them, okay? So this is sort of nice. Okay, but one of the things, if you've worked with this kind of model, is that, you know, most programmers, when you give them a problem dealing with lists, they may turn to map and grep sometimes, okay? Especially in situations where there's just a couple of independent lists that need processing. But when we have lots of data and we have to start combining it, then it gets a little bit harder to see how we can describe that in a functional style. And we tend to say, well, this problem is much more clear to me if I can just write a for loop, an if statement, have a hash here and it's collecting some things, 
um, you know, and, and sort of just describe my program in a more imperative fashion. And what I kind of, you know, bothers me a little bit about the supply thing uh, is that, you know, if we only have things like map and grep and all of these different operations, as soon as you get to a point where you need to combine data from different asynchronous sources and you don't have a good built-in mechanism for doing it, it's quite difficult to work out what to do. So what is the equivalent of a for loop in the asynchronous world? Okay, try to imagine what it would be. A for loop is synchronous. Okay, that is when it wants the next item, it, you know, if it can't get it immediately, it has to block. So what if we had an asynchronous loop? Okay, well in Perl 6 we do. We call it whenever. So instead of writing all of that code with tap before and so forth, I can just say whenever I'm watching this path and a change happens, okay, I will maybe run the tests. And because this is a loop, you can do things like putting a last phaser in there. That's a, a special block that runs on the last value of the loop to handle the end of the supply, for example. Okay, so the thing about a whenever loop, okay, if you think about the for loop, you reach it in the code, okay, the for loop runs, and then your code continues running. But an asynchronous loop, okay, it says, oh, I want to run the loop whenever this event occurs, and then your code just proceeds on straight away. Okay, and this loop will run sometime in the future, many times in the future, whenever a file is, uh, is changed. Now, whenever can go in two places. One is inside a supply block, and one is inside a React block. A supply block is your way of saying, what I want to do is take one or more sources of asynchronous data using whenever, and I want to do something with them, okay, maybe this if statement here, and then I want to emit a value onto whatever is tapping me, okay? Now, if you have looked at Perl 6 much and you have seen gather and take, okay, gather take is a construct where you can make an array by just writing a block of code, and whenever you want to produce a result value, you say take, and it runs lazily, okay? So it only produces values when needed. Supply is like an asynchronous gather, okay? And emit is like an asynchronous take. Now, sometimes you don't want to produce any more values, you just want to react. And react is exactly that. When you hit a react block, it basically runs and it's like starting an event loop, okay? And it will work on all of the whenevers until finally maybe all of them get to an end, okay? Or you decide you're, you're done now, okay? And then you, you would fall out the React block. Um, React blocks are pretty good for like the main loop of your, of your program. Okay. So let's get back to writing a test runner. So here is my uh, program, okay? I'm using the nice Perl 6 uh, main subroutine here. So you can see I take uh, one test directory and any number of source directories, and that will do the command line passing for me. And then I have a React block, okay? This is the main event loop of my program here. And I say, whenever the test directory changes, okay, maybe run the, uh, the tests, and then, I loop over all the source directories that I've been given, and I can just uh, set up whenevers for them as well. Now, this is one of the really powerful things about supply and React. You don't have to put the whenever directly inside of it. That is a completely normal for loop, just going over all the source directories and setting up an event subscription to each of them, okay? But even more than that, you can actually start new whenever loops whenever you want, okay? You can actually start a new one when you're inside of another whenever reacting to an event. 
and they all will get attached to the, the same reactor or the same supply. Okay, so if any of them produce an error, then they'll all get sort of collected into the, the same place. So if we look at uh, maybe run tests, okay, the next step, what's this doing? Well, uh, in here, okay, pretty simple code, you have a state variable there. And uh, I just set it as saying running test is false. That assignment to the state variable only runs the first time, okay, we come into this subroutine. So it starts out as false, and then I will come in here and I'll say, unless I'm already running the tests, then I'll say, running the tests, okay, I'll give the reason that we're running it. The reason was passed here, source changed or tests changed. We then will set that uh, Boolean flag to true, and then I'll say, whenever I have run the tests, okay, whenever that's finished, print a couple of new lines, and then just set that flag to false. Now what you'll notice, if I just go back here, you might wonder, what thread do uh, these notifications come on? And the answer is any thread, okay? And that means potentially you could be in a situation where you get two different threads wanting to uh, run these at the same time. Now what actually happens in a React block is we, we take care of one at a time concurrency semantics for you. So we make sure that you never end up with two threads inside of there at a time. Now of course we might try and schedule things to try and minimize the number of threads that are in there for locality, okay, but we, we make sure that if you're using these constructs you don't have to think about that. So if we were doing this under a more traditional programming model, and we had a bunch of event threads, then we might actually have to go and put a lock here, okay? I don't have to with this. It's just a Boolean flag, and it's safe. What does run tests do? It uses our old friend, proc async, from earlier. And all I'm gonna do is I'm, uh, we actually have a standard out and standard error available of supplies as well, because they're sources of data that arrive over time as the process runs. You'll notice that we've, you know, we've kind of got these common data structures that we reuse um, and let you use in your asynchronous APIs, and you can put all, all kinds of things behind them. And we just say whenever standard out produces a value, okay, and I can put it into a variable there, output, and I'll just indent it by a couple of uh, spaces so it looks a bit nicer, okay, and uh, emit it, uh, just print that out. And uh, what I'll do is I'll also take standard error and I'll just say whenever it outputs something, just discard it, okay, I don't care. And then we'll start the process. Now, start returned the promise, you might remember. And back here, I said whenever run tests, it turns out whenever can treat a promise just like a sort of one-off supply, okay? So it treats it like a supply and it produces one result and is done, or that produces an exception, okay? So uh, we know how to, to use whenever with both of them. Okay, and uh, that is it. That is our test runner. So what you see here is we've got fairly explicit uh, asynchronous control. One thing you might wonder about the weight, and I mentioned this because uh, someone asked me recently about it. They said, is it like in C sharp? where if you want to put an await somewhere, you have to refactor all of the code that calls it. And the answer is no, ours works like a coroutine, okay? So when you await, we, even if you're lots of stack frames deep and then you await, um, you know, then we can say, okay, we can use this thread for something else, okay? And we resume it later. But what we've done is we've gone and really added a bunch of structured programming support here for asynchrony so that you get to sort of avoid all of this uh, mess of callbacks, okay? You don't have to think about event loops. We're working at a much higher level here. So we've seen parallelism and asynchrony. Let's finish up with a little bit of a look at concurrency. The word concurrent can actually mean competitor. It's a little bit archaic in English, but it, it can mean that. And uh, so concurrency is all about competition to access some kind of 
resource that we want to mutate, okay? And uh, let's just take a really simple example, okay? We're going, checking in for flights, and uh, people are using the check-in machines, they want to choose a seat. And we must make sure that we do not put two passengers in the same seat, okay? So if I go and my friend goes and we, we both try to pick seat 42A, okay, because we like that one, then it should say, no, whoever got it first will have the seat and whoever didn't get it will have to pick the other one. This is a classic concurrency problem. What you'll notice compared to parallelism, in parallelism, we chose to do things in parallel. Concurrency chooses you. Okay, you don't get to decide whether you have a concurrent system or not. Multiple passengers checking in, okay, that, that is just concurrent. So concurrency is a property of the problem. So here's just a bit of code I might write naively, okay, uh, that can run into some problems. So this is a class, and the class here just has a, a hash of seats we set it up as all the seats available, and then we uh, just have a bit of code here, okay, and it checks if that seat exists at all on the flight. If it does, uh, it's fine. If not, we say there's no such seat. And then we uh, see that, say the seat is taken if the, uh, the Boolean in there is true, and otherwise, uh, we put that passenger in that seat. Now, if two threads were to come into here at the same time, there's a data race there, okay? They could both run the first line of code, and they both would say, oh, the seat is available, okay? And then they would both race to put their passenger into it, and one person would uh, lose their seat, okay? So uh, this is a bit of a problem. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, you know, so maybe we go and start putting locks around things and so on, but again, uh, we actually want to get a bit more structure into this. So what we might do is turn to something called a monitor. A monitor is a kind of class that promises that only one thread can be in any of its methods on a particular object instance at a time. It also has some ways of signaling when certain conditions have been reached and so on, but we don't need that for this. Now, monitors are not actually built into Perl 6, but there is a module called OO monitors, okay? And you might say, okay, it's a module, so it must mean I have to change my code quite a bit. But it turns out Perl 6 is a very mutable language. The entire change you need to make to your code to turn this into a monitor is you say use OO monitors, and then you change the word class to monitor, and you're done, okay? It will take care of enforcing all the locking discipline for you. We have very rich metaprogramming in Perl 6, okay? We're very much able to decide that calling a method means something a little bit different. And in this case, calling a method means we need to acquire a lock around the method calls. Now, okay, that, uh, you know, that's not bad, okay? That means we can, we can package uh, new kinds of object behavior up into, into new keywords, okay? I bet people will start making MVC frameworks and adding a controller keyword and so on at some point. But uh, again, there's, there's a little bit of a, a sort of hold on a minute here, okay? Because one of the things that you might realize is that uh, suppose we're using asynchrony uh, to build a web application. So maybe we're using HTTP server async, okay, which is a module that gives you an asynchronous HTTP server. If you're doing that, then the problem will be that you will have multiple request threads coming in. They will go for the monitor, okay, and one of them will block. And that maybe isn't the, you know, the best we could do. We might say, well, I'd actually like that thread to go and get on with something else until it can proceed with this operation. Can we do better? And there's actually an alternative to OO monitors called OO actors, okay? Again, just put the, the keyword actor instead. 
This gives you an object that will only run one method at a time, but it runs all the method calls on it asynchronously and gives you back a promise. Okay, so instead we can just write that. Okay. Now, of course, if you wanted to get really clever and you thought that you didn't want to be so explicit and have to write a wait here, an alternative way of implementing this would actually be to do the await inside of the, uh, the, the code that is handling the dispatch here so that you can just call methods as normal without writing await and it's completely transparent, okay? And that would also be a very easy module to write. So there's, uh, there's plenty of, of flexibility we have here, but uh, this is the explicit way, okay? We just await the result of that method call. And you'll note we didn't have to wrap our methods up in anything at all. Okay, it just looks like a normal class just differentiated by a different keyword and behaving differently because of the, the extra functionality that module provides. Okay, and then if we, uh, we have a request thread, okay, it blocks because someone else is busy in that code, um, then it's free to do something else. So what we've done there is tried to, again, you know, get the locking condition variables you know, thread IDs, all of that stuff out of your code completely, okay? And just let you very declaratively talk about the concurrency semantics that you desire over the data that you are protecting. Okay, so that was a look through parallelism, asynchrony, and concurrency. We made it. I think the key message in this is not you know, we, we've had a lot of, uh, you know, years building these things out of threads, out of callbacks, out of locks. What I've shown you today is a bunch of code where we didn't see a lock once, okay? We didn't have to write things in terms of callbacks. We had nice structured ways of solving the problems. I think that it's really time for our languages to do this. Okay, it's really important to me that uh, the things we've chosen in Perl 6, uh, you know, they, they provide you a choice as to whether to do things asynchronously and in a, a parallel way or, you know, express your concurrency as you need it. But the things that we provide are there to, to try and allow you to write code that does not have to be massively more difficult than the code you would write synchronously. Okay, and we try and take a lot of those bits of complexity, pull them out of your code into infrastructure, uh, do a little bit of light syntactic relief, okay? And uh, I think that that can make a huge, huge difference to the maintainability and the readability and the reliability, okay? Because error handling suffers with a lot of callback approaches uh, in your programs. Okay, so uh, arigato gozaimasu. And uh, I think um, when building a pipeline with uh, race and hyper, yep. you don't provide any arguments to leave it up to the to yes. Is there a way of uh, getting information how many uh, workers and how many threads it has used? Um, not at the moment, but that sounds very much like something that we could uh, we could do. Um, and I, what I would like to have is a is a nice sort of debugging API for some of this stuff as well, particularly for the scheduler. So th the answer is not not yet, but it's it's planned. Um, yeah. Okay.
Okay, the, the question was, um, I showed OO monitors and OO actors. Um, how complicated are they? Are they a lot of code or are they just a little bit of code? The answer is they're both pretty short. Um, the way that they work is they just intercept method calls, okay? So what, what they do is they, they add, they make sure your class gets an extra secret attribute to hold the lock, okay? So that's just an add attribute. They then make sure that whenever a method is called, instead of handing back the method, they hand back a closure that obtains the lock and then runs the method. Um, OO actors is a little bit more complicated, but they are both pretty short. Um, you, can, you can find them both on GitHub. I think I can safely say um, OO monitors is only a little bit longer because it handles condition variables too, but we're talking maybe 50 lines of code, uh, max 100 uh, to do that. So, so no, they're, they're not very complex. Um, they, they're quite easy to realize with Perl 6 as meta programming. Um, is there any way to exit whenever a loop from inside a loop, or is there any way to force it forward from outside a loop? Yeah, it, it's a loop, so you say last, just like in a for loop, exactly the same keywords. So, and if you don't want to do anything more in the current iteration, you say next. Okay, and if you say last inside of a whenever, then we automatically unsubscribe from the supply that you tapped as well, and it does any cleanup. So if it, for example, if you had a whenever um, supply dot interval, okay, and it was a timer, and at some point after a while you said last in that loop, we would go and clear up the timer for you. So it, it's just normal loop control flow operators that you use. That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The features you just uh, explained, uh, how do you compare with other languages? So do you think how things is super with um, power and concurrency asynchrony or some other competitive to some other? <laughs> Okay, so, so the, the question is, you know, how, how do I rate what Perl 6 does in concurrency compared to other languages? Um, I think whenever you do this stuff, there's trade-offs. Um, so, you know, we can't make some of the guarantees that, for example, uh, languages like Rust and Erlang can about, you know, you cannot get a race, for example. Uh, you know, they, they can go a very long way by choosing type systems um, or you know strictures um, so that they can get those sort of you know guaranteed safety properties um, so I'd say you know we, we've sort of chosen the uh, you can shoot yourself in the foot but you know let, let, let us try really hard to give you things where you will not um, so you know we, we've made that trade-off um, I, I guess we've made that trade-off in a similar sort of way to go. In terms of you know, how I'd compare the concurrency constructs we have, um, I think we've chosen pretty good ones. Um, you know, I, I think we've done right to try and actually bring them into the language um, rather than saying that uh, you know, things like you know, asynchronous data has to be this, this unusual thing that you need a library to deal with. Um, and I think in actually, Choosing to have supply and promise as your primitives for one asynchronous thing and a stream of asynchronous things in the language, we actually have done pretty well at providing API for that. Now, other folks have got that kind of right as well. Um, maybe in C sharp, they've done pretty well uh, with it. I'd say, um, you know, if you've been looking at supply and saying it looks like Rx in C sharp, one thing that I'll note is that having used that a lot, um, I hit a point where I find it really hard to think about certain problems functionally. And I really want something like Perl 6's uh, supply whenever React uh, related stuff. 
So I'd, I'd say that, you know, we've, we've picked some, uh, some trade-offs, which you always have to do in this area. Um, but I think we've, we've picked a good set of things. And over time, you know, we'll be able to polish these a good bit. Um, we'll be able to, to also, you know, build a good bit of tooling around it so that we can, can sort of do some race detection as well. In fact, I already did a primitive version of that. So, so yeah, I, 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 I'm quite, you know, excited by the things that we've, we've chosen. Um, I've no doubt that in, you know, 10 years time, the state of the art as a whole will have advanced. Um, the good news is that Perl 6 is a very malleable language, um, so I think, you know, we'll be able to grow into the future as well. Um, you know, you saw that monitors and actors I could just add, and they felt very, very natural, even though they were a module. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I feel fairly good about it, um, but I'm sure, you know, the next decades will be a, uh, a harsh teacher of, uh, of where we call things not quite right, but that goes for every language, so. In pulses, is there any way to do concurrent, concurrent tasks, not, not in a single, single computer, but uh, in a distributed way uh, through networks and transparently? Okay, the, the question was, is, is there a way to do distributed computing where we start to set these things off across multiple processes, not just multiple threads? Uh, the answer is no, that isn't something that we have put into the language. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I feel that, that that really needs to happen in module space, uh, at least first. Um, you know, I, and I think the, the sorts of things that you need to take into account and the many different factors you have in how you distribute things uh, probably mean that, you know, you, you want different solutions there. I'm also not convinced that we're, you know, maybe we will in the future reach a point where we say, okay, that is the right one to put into the language. What I will say is I think that the metaprogramming stuff we have will allow you to build these things in a very transparent way. Um, and, you know, I am, I'm quite excited to, uh, to sort of see what we will end up with there. So I'd say, no, at the moment, we don't have a really good transparent story on that. Um, but, you know, I think we have all the ingredients for someone to build us a really beautiful one, um, or a few of them uh, in the future. And I, I hope that will happen. Maybe I'll, I'll even work on something there, because it's, it's a very interesting problem. Okay. Thank you.